Uh, my name is Dustin Bajer. Um, and my background is, uh, is actually in education. And so I've taught high school for about 10 years. Um, and I, I joke that I keep trying to resign from teaching, uh, to work on other projects, bees and trees mainly. Um, I do continuously kind of get roped back. And so recently I was roped into teaching, um, half time once again, uh, with Evan to public, uh, working on some projects, usually around, uh, food and, um, nature. And so it's kind of my wheelhouse. Um, I uh, really kind of um, have this vision of uh, combining the built and the natural world. And so that's, I would say, largely the the thing that drives me and most of the projects that I work on, whether it be tree growing um, or uh, working with bees in cities. And I actually think that there's a lot of really great benefits to it. We tend to think of cities and nature being two completely separate systems. Um, but I actually think that if you can combine those systems, you actually get what ecologists call an ecotone. So you get all of the connections and things that happen in a city. And cities are really vibrant places filled with connections. You've got all these connections that you get in an ecosystem. Um, and if you can combine those two, you actually get all the diversity of one and all the diversity of the other meeting. And so you end up with these really incredible places. Um, and in ecology, this would be an example that would be like a forest edge coming up to a lake. Um, and so a, a city that partners with nature is kind of my, um, has been the driving thing around much uh, of the stuff that I've done. So imagine having uh, ecology that processes wastewater or even like waste resources like um, organic matter. Imagine that the hard surfaces of your city are um water harvesting structures or our uh, thermal mass to help grow plants. Imagine that you could grow food in public spaces. Um, that's that's kind of the 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 uh, the type of Edmonton that I would really love to 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 create. And um a little bit more specific about plants, I uh, about I guess about two thousand and thirteen, so almost about ten years ago, I fell in love with this plant behind me. So this here is a picture of uh, some fruit on the Capilano apricot tree. Our, there's actually three of them. There's unfortunately two of them now. Um, and I nobody really knew much about this tree, but this tree was Gorilla Garden, so planted without permission in along 75th Street. So uh, Capilano Freeway, hence the name Capilano Apricots. It was later revealed in a really fantastic episode of the Let's Find Out podcast. Um, that these trees originated in Harbin, China. So sometime in the 1930s, a Mr. Pitson in Harbin, China, sent pits to, um, to the Agricultural Research Station in Brooks, Alberta. The researchers there grew out some ap apricot trees and took the pits from those apricot trees and gorilla gardened them all over the place, including here in Edmonton. And so that was sometime in the early 60s. And these we've got these big, beautiful apricot trees in a city where most people don't think that you can grow apricots. Um, and I decided, I think it probably would have been about 2015, 2014, 2015, um, I decided I was going to go and collect some pits. And I showed up and all the apricots were picked but I noticed that there were some like smushed, squished apricots on the ground. And so I literally got on my hands and knees uh, on the side of the like 75th street and picked through the grass until I found a a uh, hundred apricot pits. I think it took me, it probably took me about two hours, but I found a hundred apricot pits and I was like, that's good. A hundred is a nice round number. I went home and I planted them on the side of my house just like a couple feet from my foundation and I planted all hundred apricots in about four square feet. So 25 square feet per tree or sorry, 25, 25 trees per square feet. Sorry. And uh, I totally forgot about it. The following spring, I was doing a little bit of cleaning and um, just in the yard. And I noticed these funny little plants uh, next to the side of my house. And I thought, well, isn't that weird? They're all in rows. And then it hit me, oh my God, the apricots. And uh, by the end of fall or by the end of that summer, um, I had a little apricot forest. And so this is a picture of that apr apricot, um, uh, of that forest, taking a look down at it. 
Uh, so 100 little apricot trees, actually 96 apricot trees. So not all 100 germinated, but 96% uh, is pretty good. And I thought, holy cow, you can grow a lot of trees in a really small space. And so I let them go through winter. And the following spring, I carefully kind of excavated the seed bed and pulled these trees out bare root and ended up um, at the time I sold a bunch. So um, Justine, who's in the call today, actually, uh, I, I came in and I did a session for the uh, for the master gardening course at the at the um, uh, U of A Botanic Garden, uh, which she was coordinating. And uh, some folks there bought trees. Um, I ended up selling some some other trees to some friends and family. Uh, and I was uh, kind of blown away that uh, you can grow you can grow trees in a city because I I've worked at um, botanic gardens before um, the George Pegg Botanic Garden specifically and I've worked at some tree nurseries before and um, you know growing in tight little spaces especially something that can obviously get really big and live a really long time it didn't occur to me that you can do that um, in something like four square feet oh. I did that for a few years and uh, I um was doing a little bit of consulting for Northlands at the time at the Edmonton Urban Farm, mostly doing tours. And uh, they ended up giving me a, access to about a, a 1,500 square feet of garden space and ended up taking all of these plants I was growing and putting them in there at the nursery. Um, and growing, you know, obviously not just apricots, but trying to grow interesting things like these pawpaws behind me. So that is the largest fruit native to North America. Uh, more on pawpaws in a little bit. Uh, these are some little bristlecone pines, which are really long lived trees. Um, they can live for thousands of years. So I love the idea of trying to grow a bunch of, you know, many thousand year old plants in the city of Edmonton. Uh, this is American chestnut, which is functionally extinct to where it's native to in North America, um, taken out by a blight. But, you know, could we get some American chestnut uh, thriving here, which might also be um, a source of seed perhaps down the line, which could then go back to where it's native to and perhaps uh, help reforest it um, on the east, uh, east coast of North America. And so very kind of quickly, I ended up with... Um, you know, hundreds of trees, if not like a thousand little trees. And the question kind of was, you know, like, what do you do with a thousand trees? And I had been selling trees, which, you know, which was fine. Um, but I was accumulating trees faster than I could sort of sell them. And selling them is a lot of kind of coordination. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, education is my background. And so I thought, what if there was a way that we could get these plants into the hands of folks in the city of Edmonton who could use them the most. And so what if we could get them into the hands of like school groups, um, community groups, community gardens? What if we could take a look around the city and we could identify neighborhoods that maybe don't have as much access to green space or shade? Um, what if we could use trees to mitigate urban heat island or, um, or, or flash floods? Uh, and the idea to create a community of um, you know, to to propagate plants and to get them into out into the city of Edmonton was was born. And that project uh, we've been calling Shrub Scriber, and it's uh, a little bit over a year old. And there's some shrub scribers in the room, so thanks for for one <laughs> joining this community um, uh, because it's you know you are the community. And um, I think this propagation course that I'm about to talk about is really an extension of that. Um, so shrub, shrub scriber is, is primarily local, everybody is local, um, but it is there, we have an online space um, where we have courses and uh, groups and where we um, have events, sometimes virtual, often in, in person. Uh, and here's that same nursery, uh, really just like a month ago. Um, and so it looks much different from... <laughs> From this here, it's it's there's a lot more trees and they're a lot bigger. Uh, a lot of these trees need to need to get out definitely in the spring and into the hands of of, of folks to plant them. Um, uh, recently, you know, we've donated some trees to Grosvenor. This was uh, actually just this past week, um, and so here we have some trees sent over to W. P. Wagner High School. Um, this up here is uh, a, a Edmonton Catholic School, the the center for. Um, 
learning diversity. We have uh, some teachers uh, to the left of me who are working with students to plant a food forest. And then in the top left-hand corner, those were some trees that we sent over to uh, Sincunia, uh, which is a uh, an organization that um, supports uh, African immigrants. And so we threw in some trees in their community garden. So this is an example of some of the things that we've been able to do, um, combating ur urban heat island, um, and uh, this map, by the way, was put together by students from King's University uh, for subscribers to help us kind of identify neighborhoods uh, with extreme temperature swings. Uh, we had some students at Nate put together a um, sort of some social indicators. So we know that the elderly and the um, and children are especially prone to urban heat island. And so we put together social or they put together 11 social indicators to come up with some neighborhoods in the city of Edmonton that could uh, most benefit from trees. Um, and then this last year, we also started working with schools. And so this is um, these are apricots again. Um, and so we started sending um, propagation boxes, seeds and soil, along with instructions to schools and having uh, students grow out plants, and then they bring those plants home and plant them all throughout the neighborhood. And so the last year has been uh, a lot really busy. Uh, but one of the things that I've noticed starting off, this was kind of like, it was like one tree weirdo growing trees. And it's very much, I think, transitioning into a much more collaborative project um, where, you know, we've got multiple people growing trees. And this is part of the reason why I wanted to relaunch uh, a propagation course in the fall. Now, fall might seem like a strange time to start a gardening course, um, uh, to start a gardening course. And uh, but but it it actually is is kind of perfect. Um, most vegetables are annuals, and so they are happy to grow as long as the conditions are 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 right. And so um, you plant an annual, you give it a little bit of warmth, a little bit of water, and it starts growing. A lot of perennials, uh, woody plants in particular, have um, have. Uh, sort of delays built into them. And so, especially if you think about the fact that a lot of fruits are consumed by animals, and so they have to have these tough seed coats to protect themselves when they go through digestion. Any plant that's living outside here has to contend with winter, and so they're actually dormant, and they want to wait through winter in order to grow. And so, while fall seems like a strange time to get a bunch of seeds and to start thinking about growing them out, there's actually lots of little steps that we need to do between now and spring in order to get these things to grow, some of them taking six months or longer. And so now is actually the perfect time to talk about woody plant propagation and to start a woody plant propagation course. Uh, I see in the chat that um, we have a question about how do schools participate? Um, yeah, right now, uh, maybe we'll get to that question. We'll, we'll loop back to it towards the end there, but we are um, continuously kind of tweaking that little formula there. And I think I have some some exciting news to be able to, to, to share uh, soon about that. Um, so this propagation course is um, the resources are going to be online. Um, and so anybody who joins will have access to Shrubscriber and the subscriber community. So the 70 existing uh, members, um, we have a garden design, an ecological garden design course that is in there, so they get access to that, uh, as well as all of the regular events um, and workshops that we do. And, and um, so all of that, anybody who joins this course would have access to that. Uh, we're also going to have step-by-step -step instructions on how to propagate um, all of the seeds that participants will receive. Those instructions are going to be written as well as filmed, uh, and so they'll be embedded within uh, within the Shrubscriber platform. Uh, we're going to do monthly check-ins sort of just like this. Uh, throughout the winter, we'll largely, you know, be able to do this online. I think once the weather kind of warms up, uh, we'll have some opportunities to do some face-to-face -face stuff. So we'll be able to go through uh, any kind of questions, um, uh, you need a little bit of show and tell, a lot of like, hey, what's happening with this plant? 
Um, we will record and post those so that if you can't make all of those uh, sessions, then uh, you'll still be able to review them afterwards. Uh, we're going to get seeds from at least six different species. I think we can actually do a little bit more than six, and we'll get to that uh, very quickly. And by joining and taking the propagation course, like in addition to being a, a, a member of Shribscriber and getting seeds and instructions on and step-by-step -step instructions on, on propagating those out, you're actually also helping fund um, tree donations. And so just by taking the course, uh, we're going to uh, be able to provide um, six trees to a school or a community group um, and or help them uh, do some propagation. Um, so as an example, uh, those propagation kits, bringing them to schools. Uh, so let's talk about some of the plants uh, that were um, uh, some of the seeds that that, I'll, that we'll have access to this year. So the first is um, I want to do something in the prunus uh, genus. So last year we grew a lot of apricots out. I do have a lot of um, plums at the moment. So specifically Mount Royal plums. Now Mount Royal plums do come true to seed. So meaning that the, the plant and the fruit on the plant is very similar to the parent. That's not always true with, with different fruits. So as an example, apple seedlings look nothing like their parents. So the apple falls very far from the tree, but the, the uh, plum does not fall very far from the tree. If it is a, um, a European plum, some of the hybrid plums, there's some some changes there. Uh, I also have quite a few Russian almond seeds. So this is a Russian almond behind me. It's actually a, a shrub. Uh, it's mostly grown for its flowers. Um, so it's mostly grown as an ornamental, but it does produce a fuzzy fruit, and uh, which is you know just like an almond, a green fuzzy fruit. And on the inside of that green fuzzy fruit is the pit itself. Um, which can then be cracked and roasted. And so a lot of people don't realize that an, that an almond is actually like the pit of a fruit in the same way um, that this Russian almond is the pit of this fruit. Both of those plants in the same genus, in the genus Prunus. Big genus that includes nectarines, apricots, almonds, cherries, um, a lot of plants going on in that genus. Uh, the next thing that we're going to propagate out is uh, butternuts and black walnuts. Uh, these are all locally, actually, I should say here, th these, these plums uh, and Russian almonds are locally harvested. So they're all from uh, Edmonton. Um, the Russian almonds from plants over at the nursery, the plums from uh, members of the community who've been able to, pro to uh, um, collect those for us. Um, Juglins, so these are, these are our walnuts. Uh, it has been a heck of a year for walnuts in Edmonton. Um, any of our walnut trees, we don't have a lot of them, but have been um, producing an incredible amount of fruit. And I think in the back uh, yard here, I have um, uh, six big giant tubs of walnuts from two different uh, two different butternuts. So that's the white walnut. Uh, one of those uh, for somebody who I uh, met a few years ago and has been saving butternuts for me. Uh, Trevor, also who's here tonight, also um, collected some butternuts from uh, from his neighbor's tree, and then was lucky enough to spot a black walnut this uh, past uh, past year and uh, collect a lot of black walnuts from that. So. This is um, totally kind of different propagation from, from prunus. One of the things that I really wanted to do is I wanted to try to pick a bunch of plants that would require different skills um, so that folks can then, you know, get a lot of different uh, techniques under their belts. Um, the third plant uh, that I have seeds for is, um, is goji berry. And so our Chinese community, just like all settlers communities, you know, brought plants with them. One of the plants that they brought with them early on is goji, which is native to uh, like the Himalayas. It is in the Solanaceae family. So it's in the same family as peppers and tomatoes and eggplant um, and potatoes and tobacco. Um, so very kind of strange plant, but it's woody. Um, produces uh, so it's a it's a large shrub, kind of getting about twelve feet tall and wide. Uh, if you let it, um, you can see this flower here very much looks like a tomato flower, except it's purple, and these little fruits. 
If you think of them as fruits, if you think about berries and you eat it, you might be disappointed because I don't find them overly sweet. But if you think about the little peppers that they are, tomatoes or peppers or eggplants, they they are they do have quite a nice kind of savory flavor and a cool local um, a cool local plant with a local history. Um, the uh, Young Fei, uh, who is a member of Subscriber, is a local artist who's been researching gojis um, and has propagated a lot of gojis uh, with Subscriber. Um, and so, uh, yeah, she she if we ever get a chance to talk to to Young Fei about gojis, she'd be the person to do it. Uh, I made some jam and uh, oh, with theirs this week. So there you go, yummy goji berry jam. Is it sweet? I guess you'd add sugar, right? Or is it more of a savory thing? Either way, I want to eat some, try some goji berry jam. Sugar for jam. There you go. And so uh, the next plant, I've lost track of what we're at now. Number four, the next plant um, that I, I just ordered a bunch of seeds in for is a uh, honey locust. I was able to get seeds from a, a thornless variety. This is a really cool uh, Native American, um, like, like plant that's native to America, um, the continent, um, not necessarily the country. And... Uh, what's cool about this plant, so it's in the pea and bean family, but it's a tree. So uh, if you go to New York, you'll see like large honey locusts as um, as boulevard trees. They have these very delicate little leaves. The city of Edmonton has been playing around with them as boulevards, though I only know of like a half a dozen honey locusts in the city of Edmonton at the moment. Beautiful sort of uh, uh, inflorescence of, of, of flowers. Um, and they produce a big long bean that actually has a sweet flesh on it. So hence the name honey locust. Uh, these trees are interesting. One of the things I love about trees is in order to propagate them, you usually have to partner them. You have to think about what the plant is trying to do in the wild. And so this makes a really big bean pod. So it's huge. It's much too big for like a squirrel or a bird. And it seems like when they fall on the ground, nobody touches them. And in fact, there was some ecologists who were looking at all of these honey locust pods on the ground and they were going like, what is this tree doing? Like, it, it doesn't make any evolutionary sense that a tree would make a fruit that nobody's eating. Turns out that what this tree is trying to do is attract elephants, so this is a this is a, a a plant that is native to North America. Um, has been in North America for like millions of years, and it's trying to attract elephants. Um, has really big spikes on it, really big thorns on it, because it wants it wants the elephant to eat the fruit, but not the plant itself. Uh, and so it, it protects itself, and um, it's lost its elephants. That's right. So so Kim in the comment said mammoths, right? Um, yeah, they have no sense of time. They still think that the mammoths and the mastodons are here. Nobody has told the honey locust that their elephants are gone. Um, and so they're still trying to attract them. Uh, and what's in, like, if you want to grow these, they have these little rock hard seeds, like they're, they're incredibly tough and you can do things like soak them in hydrochloric acid to break up the seed coat, which sort of sounds extreme, but makes sense if you think about the elephant is going to be swallowing this and it's going to be going through its digestive system. Uh, I find pouring hot boiling water on them uh, is, is enough to like break the seed coat down. Sometimes I'll take sandpaper to the seed coat, but if you got to get through that seed coat, it needs to think that it's gone through an elephant in order to germinate. Um, so like super fascinating when you think about each of these plants and how they're propagated. So this is a fruit probably eaten by an animal. So that's a clue in how it's propagated. These here, what eats, what eats, um, nuts. I know somebody wants to shout it out or throw it in the chat. What if I should just say it? There you go. Squirrels. So squirrels collect these nuts, they bury them, they forget about half of them. So that's a clue in how to propagate these. Um, so, you know, here we have this tiny little berry. Uh, these, these little berries are, uh, the, the birds love them. And so they're trying to, um, 
they're trying to uh, disperse the seeds that way. And so how do we, how do we play bird in order to get these things to grow? Um, so the poly in, in text says, not sure where it's native to, but there's a similar plant, um, to honey locust in, in India. And that makes sense, right? You have, you have the Asian elephant. Um, so there's probably similar plants in Africa. There's a plant that's related to honey locust. So in the Fabaceae, the pea and bean family called an acacia, right? It's, it's, it's the tree that like, if you watch, um, the jungle, uh, not the jungle book, the lion King, right. That like, um, I can never remember the 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 monkey's name, but he's got the like the handprint with the or like the cub print. Anyway, that tree that 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 character is in is an acacia. It is related to honey locust and is trying to attract elephants. Yeah, so also in India, the acacia. Yeah, there's acacia is a pretty big group of uh, pretty big genus of plants. Um, the next one that oops, the next one that I that we have access to is a um sea buckthorn. So sea buckthorn is uh it's a nitrogen fixing plant. Um some people love it or they hate it. It produces a um it produces a uh an, an orange fruit that to me tastes kind of tropical, like it almost has like a pineapple flavor to it. Um grows as more of as a, a large shrub um, than anything. Um, this next one I'm really excited about. So a couple of years ago, I propagated some ginkgo and I was able to get a hold of some more ginkgo seeds. And so this is something that I think would be fun to propagate um, uh, with the group. Ginkgo is an ancient tree. So it evolved in North America or in what is now North America, uh, like 260 million years ago. So before flowering plants, it's actually a conifer. Um, and uh, it, it, but it does produce a weird fruit and the fruit is um, quite, quite stinky. So it produces a male and a female plant. The fruit it has a little bit of a fungi smell. Um, and if we think about like what kind of animal might a fruit 200 a 260 million year old fruit be trying to attract that maybe gives us some indication on how we could grow this thing and if you think about 260 million years ago we don't have birds we don't have mammals and in fact we don't have much but dinosaurs and so this plant here was was evolved during the dinosaurs and still thinks that there are dinosaurs. And the reason it makes a stinky fruit is it's trying to attract uh, scavenging dinosaurs. Um, so Justine, yeah, so your ginkgo, really, yeah, beautiful in the fall, right? Beautiful. And Edmonton does have some ginkgo plants, um, though certainly not, not very common. Um, so native to North America, if you go back 260 million years ago, um, it ends up spreading across the globe and then going extinct everywhere except for Asia. So depending on your timeline, on your time perspective, um, you know, it, we could say it's a, you know, welcome back ginkgo or, um, you know, or we're bringing in a plant from China. Um, the other one that I'd like to grow, I don't have as many seeds of this here, but I do have some, uh, some uh, large seeds uh, that I collected locally. Um, I beautiful trees, um, also a nice native plant. And uh, I, you know, you probably have noticed that a lot of these, um, you know, 250, 60 million years ago, exception, not like most of these are native to North America. Um, but I thought it would be great to throw in um, uh, a native plant as well native to this region. And then the last one that 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 I want to talk about um, that I, I just ordered a bunch of seeds in um, and it was kind of an impulse buy. I, I have I have had seeds of this in the past is is a tulip tree or a tulip poplar. Um, this is this is kind of like a like a shot in the dark, um, which I always like to try. Um, these seeds were super expensive, um, but uh, this is a tree. It's native to North America. Um, it is, uh, I've never seen one. So Justine knows what it is. I have never seen one personally <laughs> that I'm aware of. And I have ordered seeds from this in the past, but I have not grown them out because it needs six months of preparation. And so this is one of those plants that 
on day one, when you get the seeds, start preparing the seeds because you won't be able to plant them out for six months. And by the time I have thought about planting them out in the past, I'm thinking six months and I'm like, well, I don't want to start them in the winter. I guess I'll have to wait till the following year. Um, but uh, was able to track down a, a seed source here. Um, so, oh, yeah, so Rebecca's saying there are some tulip trees as boulevard trees in Toronto. So apparently a zone four plant, Edmonton is now officially, you, you, you know, USDA zone four. Will they work here? Will they not work here? I don't actually know, but I think it would be um, uh, perhaps interesting to try. Um, and then the last one that I've been able to get a hold of recently is some pawpaw seeds. Uh, so the largest fruit native to North America, uh, it's a Simina triloba. It is the only member of its genus, which is not tropical. So it's actually related to like jackfruit. Um, uh, yeah, Rebecca, connect with Sherry, collect poplar seeds or, or tulip poplars, tulip tree seeds. Um, so pawpaw is a large fruit varying in size, but can get as big as a mango. Um, tastes a little bit like, um, I am told, um, a combination between a mango and a banana and a pineapple and like throw a little bit of cantaloupe in there. Sounds kind of funky. I, I've been trying to grow these on and off for a few years with some success. Um, so it is far from like a guaranteed plant, but one of my kind of goals has been to, um, uh, to try a few things. Uh, I think the right seed source planted in the right location should should do fine. Um, yeah, also a plant that was probably moved around by megafauna. I think once those megafauna disappeared, uh, humans played that role. And so the if you go to Ontario, uh, there are pawpaw patches, and it's actually believed that First Nations communities would have passed around seeds and that most of the pawpaws in Ontario are probably the result of transportation. So moving seeds uh, around from uh, uh, from the with, by, uh, via the indigenous communities there. Um, but a really cool uh, native plant, very tropical looking, tropical flavor, large fruit um, that I think is on the very edge of what we could maybe do in Edmonton. Uh, but if anybody here likes to 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 try things and push a little bit, then um, I think these last two uh, could be interesting experiments. Now I said six different tree species. Um, I've got nine listed here, um, and so uh, and so it's kind of ballooned a little bit. But I'm really hoping to offer anybody who takes this course, um, you know, as 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 much kind of variety as possible um, over the next uh, over the winter, trying to propagate these things. And so what we would do is. Anybody who anybody who wants to 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 join, uh, we would work out getting you those seeds over the next little bit, um, and uh, every single step of the way, I'll be providing resources and videos, opportunities to connect and ask questions. Uh, we're all local, and so there's there's likely some opportunities to actually meet face to face um, as well. And by spring, the goal is that everybody in the course has a little mini. Um, uh, forest of trees that they need to figure out what to do with. Um, now these trees, for anybody who's taking the propagation course, these trees are your trees. Uh, and so you can plant them, you can give them away to friends and family. Um, you know, they're, they're absolutely yours. If you do want help finding a home in a school or a community group, then we could do that as well uh, through some of the resources in Shribscriber. Um, but that is that is the hope of the the course. Um, I did run a similar project a couple of years ago. It was a lot of fun, and so I'm really looking forward to um, to, to relaunching this again uh, this time uh, on the Shripscriber uh, platform. And so I think what I'm going to do right now is just kind of open things up to questions. Hi. So I'm actually just curious. Sorry, I'm putting my kids to bed, so I'm trying yeah. to get them to bed. But yeah, like this sounds like a great course for schools yeah. uh, to get involved and then distributing the plants throughout the community. So this is something that I would love to look into more. And I was also curious if there's a cost um, that goes along with uh, your course. Yeah, so so there is. So basically, I've been offering the course to members of 
the subscriber community. And so the cost is the cost of becoming um, uh, a member. There's there's three different tiers in subscriber. So there's we've been calling them um, like seedling tree and forest. And so tree and forest members would have access to the course and all of the seeds. Uh, a tree membership is um, uh, $199 per year. Now I said per year, which might sound a little bit funny um, because I'm hoping that over time to, I'm hoping to keep running this course basically perpetually for anybody who wants. So the, so the, uh, so subscriber is like an annual um, membership. And uh, for anybody who joins at the tree level, uh, will get access to the course material, as well as seeds, and can cancel at any time. But the idea is that every year we'll be able to offer different seeds and different resources. And so for anybody who wants to uh, for anybody who wants to participate um, and keep growing trees from year to year, we can keep kind of rolling the the the, the course over from year to year. Uh, for for um, Carrie, I think what we could do too is we could connect offline about for the classroom stuff because I do have some separate things for classrooms. What I did last year is I offered a propagation box and some soil as well as. Um, as well as seeds of like one specific plant. And so this last year, this, the students grew out like an average of 70 apricots each. So it wasn't as much variety. Um, and, but then the idea is that, uh, that students could take trees home um, and some surplus ended up coming back to subscriber and we helped get it out kind of in the community. So the exact thing that you're, you're mentioning and um, that education component is a is a little bit different, and so, but let's let's connect about that. Yeah, Dustin, that's the kind of stuff that I was interested in. As well, yeah, the, yeah. the school the school stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I will send you. I'm going to give you just my email address, um, and so if if the if doing the school stuff is your something you're interested in, uh, I'll throw that in the chat. Uh, Stephen asks in the thing, this is wonderful, Dustin. Um, can I ship to Saskatchewan shipping costs? Um, yes, I could. Uh, so we did the first time I ran this course, which was prior to Shrubscriber, um, we had some folks who were outside of the city. So I ended up shipping some seeds to Kelowna at that time. Um, so if you, if that's something you're interested in, we could talk about like just covering the, the, what the shipping costs would be, which is, is generally not, not too expensive to, to ship from, from Alberta to Saskatchewan. So that's something we could do. And I'm just going to share the desktop. You might get inception here. Um, so do you see where it says, welcome to subscriber? So for those who aren't members of the subscriber community, um, if you wanted to access this course, uh, if you go to shrubscriber.com, so a bit of a, a mouthful, um, but we've got the word shrub and then scriber. Uh, and if you go here, there's some information about what the community is, um, the different things we do. We've got a few testimonials from some of our members. Um, and um, if we scroll down to the very bottom, so here's some info about the propagation course. Uh, if you scroll down to the very bottom, you will see that there is three plans. And so the first the first plan is is uh, doesn't include the propagation course and the seeds. Um, but if you click on the second or the third plan, um, it does. And so, uh, joining. So basically, if you hit subscribe, it would walk you through making a profile. Um, this would give you access to uh, the 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 course. Um, it's going to give you, and then you'll get access to uh, the seeds as well. And so we'll coordinate, and I'll, I'll um, uh, we'll arrange pickup or delivery of those seeds, or if you happen to be outside of the city, um, a way to get them uh, uh, ship them over to you. 
um, and then you will be officially enrolled. It is, um, it is a, the, the community is like a, an ongoing community. And so it is a, an annual membership, but you can cancel it at any time. Um, and so there is, there is no obligation to roll it over, uh, one from one year to the next. Um, but if you certainly wanted to maintain being a member and, uh, propagate more plants through the community, then that is, uh, something that you could, uh, choose to do. Yeah. The other thing too, for folks who are already members of subscriber, but at that, at that, um, uh, seedling level, there is like an internal plan. So if you go to courses, like if you go to courses and you, and you click on it and you're not already a member, it, it's just the difference. So basically it just upgrades you, uh, to a seedling member or to a tree member to have access to it. Um, so I got a question here is zone four only the city now or Edmonton area. Yeah. So if you're, that is true. So a lot of these plants, I wouldn't say a lot of these plants. Um, but if I go through that list, um, definitely the tulip tree and the pawpaws, I would say are a solid zone four, probably going to have a hard time growing those outside permanently, like, like outside of the city, um, the rest of them. So should be okay with the um with plums for sure the the uh russian almond um the the walnuts should be fine um i've seen walnuts in in easily in zone three occasionally in zone two uh and those are those are from local trees and so they're probably got the genes um the seed buckthorn i think is going to be just fine um the the larch is going to be just fine. Um, Trevor asks, how tall do pawpaws get? Uh, I think they can get like 30 feet tall, um, you know, but in our climate, not sure, right? I, I suspect they might stay a little bit smaller. They also are a clonal. They'll, they'll, they'll make a patch. And so one pawpaw tree will send out little suckers and turn into a few different pawpaw trees. Does it need a second pawpaw to fruit? A pawpaw needs a second pawpaw to fruit. Yeah, so you have to have two of them. Um, of the plants that are in there, so let's see. Uh, the plums, the, the Mount Royal plum is a European plum, so it's self-fertile, uh, benefits from a pollinator. The, um, the, the larch should be good. The sea buckthorn, they're, they're separate male and female plants. And so you would need two of them, uh, a male and a female for pollination. The pawpaws need another pawpaw. The tulip poplar, I have no idea actually off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Walnuts, with the, walnuts are good. Walnuts are self-fertile. With the pawpaws, do you know if there are any others in Edmonton right now? That is one that I I I do not I do not think there are any other pawpaws in Edmonton. Now I could be wrong because people have been playing with them, including myself. So I've been, like I said, those two at the end, the pawpaws and the tulip poplar, a little bit more like gamble, which is why I wanted to include them kind of in addition to the the other like six plants, which which are tougher and we know that can hack it here. Um pawpaws I have had over winter here um in the city of Edmonton um but it's also been like it's been like a one step forward one step back thing I think when it comes to some zone pushing something like a pawpaw um ultimately what needs to happen is uh let's say you have a hundred seeds and you plant out a hundred seeds technically each of those seeds is its own genetic individual and even if you know let's say the first winter takes out 90 of them and you have 10 left and the next winter winter takes out you know a nick nine more of them and you've got one left well you're slowly dwindling it down to maybe that one individual who has the ability to 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 withstand the winter and then you you know you maybe get 100 more seeds and you try that process again and so on an experiment like that you know i can't guarantee that every single one of us is going to have a thriving pawpaw at the end of the year um but i can i can i can say that you're probably all going to get some little pawpaws and be a part of a of a community experiment and that with the possibility of some of those pawpaws being able to make it and now we have a plant that can be repropagated and 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 um you know you do that second iteration of it so maybe 
um, you know, we grow out those plants and stick those two plants next to each other somewhere, baby them, and maybe they produce fruit. And now all of a sudden, for the very first time, we have some local pawpaw fruit with local pawpaw seeds. Then you take those seeds and you plant those out. And maybe that first winter kills half of them, which is way better than 90%. And the, you know, the process kind of continues. And so short game, I don't know if I would like put my money on getting pawpaws anytime soon. Long game though, it's, it's, it's like, it's possible. Yeah. You grow one in your front yard and then, oops, I'm going to gorilla plant this one just a, a block away. Just, yeah. That. Just on the, just over there <laughs> or talk to your neighbor and get one there. Yeah, there you go. The other thing too, is you can graft multiple varieties on. Um, and so if we had a couple successful pawpaws growing, then what you could do is, um, you know, we could, we could exchange, take some cuttings off of them and exchange and graft them all onto the other trees. And now everybody has a single pawpaw, but each, each tree has its own pollinator, which actually also like brings me to, to the propagation side of things. So, um, one of the things we did with the, uh, with the propagation course, the first time I ran it is there was lots of opportunities to, to do, um, to do, uh, cuttings. And so I do a lot of hardwood cuttings. So it's like middle of winter, head out into this, head out into the snow, collect some hardwood cuttings. Um, and so we'll also have some opportunities to work that into the propagation course. Um, and along with that was we'll likely do some grafting. We did some grafting in Tribscriber last year uh, where we um, uh, worked with a member of the Tribscriber community, went over and grafted some apples onto her apple trees. And so we'll con continue to keep doing things like that. So in addition to the seeds, there's also opportunities for other things like cuttings and grafting workshops and um, all that kind of stuff. Um, hi, Dustin. I have a question about some of these guys um, and um, how they do, or how they would do is if you kind of start them, get them doing them outside and then bringing like in a container and bringing them inside in the winter time and then putting them back out in the spring. Um, for the trees themselves? Mm-hmm. Yeah, most you, you most of them. So even the pawpaws will need some form of winter, um, okay. and so it doesn't mean that you can't bring it in, but you probably wouldn't be able to treat it like a house plant because what it would do is it would just kind of probably okay. grow spindly and sort of burn itself out. But what you can do is, if it's in a big pot, is you could put it in an unheated garage or in a root cellar. Um, or in an unheated boot room. So they're they're technically, you know, zone four-ish. And so they should be able to take like minus 30. Um, and I've grown pawpaws here and they've taken minus 30. Uh, minus 35 is kind of, you know, maybe getting a little bit out there. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it, it with a little bit of protection, certainly in a pot, um, I, you could, you could, probably grow pawpaws much easier than just kind of in the ground out in the open. Um, obviously be keeping your tree a little bit smaller, but different techniques. Like I've seen people keep figs outside here in Edmonton. And what they'll do is they'll grow something like a Chicago hardy fig, which is like a zone five fig. And in the fall, they just like bend the tree down and like mulch over it. Or if it's in a pot, like dig a little trench, lay the tree down cover it over in mulch and they pull it up in the spring and you know there you've got your fig and so something which is in that fig is probably less hardy than a pawpaw um and so that i i haven't tried doing that but that's probably an easier way to go than what i've been doing in the past but you wouldn't be able to bring it in and treat it like a house plant because it's still going to need winter which is counterintuitive but like if you planted an apple tree in hawaii it's not going to do well. It'll do well for like that first year and then it'll just like burn itself out. It needs winter. I had a quick question. Yeah, go ahead, Josh. So um, not all of us are pros. Yeah. So there is going to be some casualties. For sure. So um, what does it look like for the number of seeds we would get? Yeah. So that, 
It'll yeah. depend a little bit on uh, availability. So as an example, I've got mm -hmm. tons of walnuts right now. And right. so we'll load you up on walnuts, um, which will, 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 um, you know, give you, give folks a lot of oper like a lot of room for failure. Um, the one, you know, even, even the, like, I'm looking at my little jar of, of, mm -hmm. uh, large seeds, but there's probably still thousands of seeds in there. So right. I'd like okay. to give, I'd like to kind of give folks like a dozen seeds kind of of each plant. Um, and then that way we've got lots of room for, for playing around with now. Also, most mm -hmm. of us are local too. And so let's say something catastrophic happens. Um, I can't always guarantee it, but if I've got some more walnuts to replace some of the ones that went moldy or something like that, then, then, you know, we can, we can likely do that. Um, the other thing too is, is we, we are really going to go through things like step one, step two, and, and within subscriber too, it can set little notifications and reminders and things like that, you know, so it's like, okay, it's time to, uh, you know, it's time to scarify those walnuts and, and wear down that seat coat a little bit. All right, this week, you know, a little reminder that everybody should be pulling their walnuts out of the, uh, out of cold stratification and, and getting them in the ground. Uh, and then of course, it, there's lots of opportunity for, um, you know, you can post pictures, you can post videos, we can do live streams um, of, uh, of, of all the steps along the way. And so there's like, like, er yeah, I know that everybody's a, is, is going to be kind of coming at it with different levels of, uh, um, expertise, um, or knowledge, um, but we're really going to, you know, go through this step by step so that, um, everybody can find success as much as possible. That being said, accidents happen. These are living things. And, and to be honest, changes. if I thought about, if I honestly kept track of how many plants I've killed in my entire lifetime, I, I would have been, I would have given up years ago, but that's, that's kind of part of it, right? Is, is it's part of the learning process. I've, I've started tons of things that didn't work and go, okay, well, next year I need to do that a little bit different. And hopefully what I can bring to the table is knowledge of my past mistakes and all the ways that I've killed plants in the past so that you don't make the same mistakes. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Hank says, can we keep them in pots next spring or do we need to find room in the little trees right away? No, you don't have to. Yeah. You can keep them in pots. Um, uh, absolutely. So if, if you end up in the spring with the tiny little forest, which is the goal, you don't have to find a home for them in the ground immediately. You can keep growing them in pots. The following, like today, I took a whole bunch of, I was down at the nursery and there's lots of trees in pots. I ended up healing them in a little bit. So basically like sinking the pots in the ground so that they think that they are, um, you know, so they're in the ground and they're a little bit protected. Yeah, you don't have to plant these things right away by any means. Um, Sean has a question. Thanks, Dustin. Um, I live in uh, Devon. And I've been collecting hazelnuts and choke cherries and cool. high bush cranberries and stuff like that. Uh, they seem to grow better on the north side of the river. And I'm trying to get them to grow. I live on the south side of the river uh, on the edge of Devon. And I guess my question or twofold is my intention is because out my back door is the ravines is to go out there and plant these trees. And I guess how how useful would this course be in helping me accomplish that and yeah. what obstacles could i run into like even a couple of the the I've, I've emailed with you a little bit about your walnuts and i think the apricots or something and again wanting to not just plant them in my yard but go plant them out right uh, in the river valley in the bush yeah um, I, yeah. So one of the things that happened last time I taught this course, which was, which kind of happened organically is, is f there were a lot of folks who were like, oh, I'm also growing some beaked hazelnuts. How would I grow those out? And so there was opportunity to, um, to kind of help folks also propagate some of those plants that maybe are outside of the seeds that are, that are being handed out. Um, and so I think on the propagation side of things, um, I think, I think that the course would be, would be helpful, um, in terms of, yeah, in terms of the gorilla gardening stuff, 
Uh, I mean, you're you're essentially taking some wild plants for the most part, right? When you're talking about beet hazelnuts and, um, you know, high bush cranberries, uh, choke cherries, propagating them out, and then kind of planting those back down in 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 the in the in the river valley. So that's you know, you're you're kind of doing your your gorilla rewilding, um, and all being indigenous plants. There is. Um, yeah, that's 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 probably. I don't think that too many folks are going to have an issue with that. Where maybe the municipality might say, "Hey, what are you doing?" is if is is when like apricots or walnuts kind of come into the mix. As somebody who who years ago ran the Edmonton Gorilla Gardeners, I'm I'm like I'm familiar with the process. There's a there's a part of me that kind of wants to say like go for it, and there's a part of me that wants to say like see what the rules are so that at least if you're breaking them, you know what the rules are. I think one of the interest, one of the things that interests me in trees and ecology, especially in an age of climate change, um, are questions of like um, around land use and who has access to land. And of course, like what should we be doing with that land? And then we have the issue of like native versus non-native. Obviously we don't want anything invasive. Um, you know, some of the plants that we've chosen, like, like the, um, butternuts, like they're actually really challenging to grow. They're native to North America, but they're challenging to grow where they're native to because of, uh, because of, a a, a fungus that's been attacking them. But, you know, we can grow those trees very successfully in Edmonton. And so, you know, there's ethical questions of like, do we have an obligation to, grow a plant in in order to protect it um at the same time what is also our obligation to native plants um once again more questions than answers but this is the stuff that i love to to, to geek out about yeah uh jacqueline says roots for trees events plants a lot of edible plants and you can book private groups as well yeah so in 2014 um i partnered with the uh roots for trees program to do an edible native food forest in mckinnon ravine and so they've been continuing with the edible planting which has been uh which has been fantastic um justine says there's interesting uh there's an interesting idea regarding burr oak so quercus macrocarpa it does not have a native range in Edmonton, but is naturalized in a river valley. Yeah. Um, I was out walking in, uh, walking the dog in um, Laurier Dog Park, little oak trees all over the place. So the squirrels have taken those and um, spread those around, no doubt. So it is, uh, it's it's 8.09. Um, so we've gone 10 minutes over our hour. Um, I don't want to kick anybody out, but I also don't want to hold anybody back either. Uh, I want to say thank you for coming and hanging out with me for the last 70 minutes. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to tell you about Tribscriber and to tell you about this uh, plant propagation course. If you have any questions whatsoever about it, please feel free to um, stick around for a moment and ask me now, or if you'd prefer... Uh, you can jump into the the chat and uh, grab my email address, which I will post in there again. Uh, if you're interested in joining the propagation course or joining the Shrubscriber community, you can find yeah you can do that by going to uh, shrubscriber.com. Really appreciate the, the the time you've spent with me. So I'll hang out for a little bit if you want to hang out, and uh, if not, please go and enjoy the rest of your evenings. <laughs>